What's up Blender heads? If you've never seen Ghost in the Shell, I highly recommend it. Personally, I prefer the animated version, but the live action ones, you know, it's okay. Um, in, the, in both of them, there's a sequence kind of at the beginning of the movie that's they're basically assembling the main character. She's this kind of robot cyborg thing. Um, I don't want to put the clips into the video itself uh, just because I'm afraid of YouTube copyright robots coming to get me. Um, but I'll put the links in the description so you can have a look at both of the sequences from the animated movie and the live action. Um, but essentially what happens right at the end of this sequence is that she kind of comes up out of this vat of white goo and then all the white stuff kind of flakes off her and floats away in this really kind of beautiful way. So that's the effect that we're going to create in this tutorial today. Uh, if you follow along with the steps, you'll end up creating something like this. So to get started, we'll need to jump onto the wiki human project. I've put a link down in the description and we're going to use this um, head scan that they have here. And what you want to do is grab this Alembic scene here and also grab these textures here. Okay, so in Blender, let's press A to select everything, X to delete, and then we're just going to go in and import our Alembic. So grab this Emily 2.1 Alembic scene and we'll hit import. And if we zoom out here, uh, we might just right click, uh, actually select her head, right click, go shade smooth. Uh, we're not going to use these eyelashes, so let's just pick those and delete them. Also, we might just do a little bit of a clean up here. There's a bunch of empties, um, so we're just going to get rid of all of these. You can see the empties are the ones with the kind of a cross symbol on them. Your meshes here uh, have a triangle. So we want to just pick all of these meshes, just holding down shift to select all of these and then hover our mouse over in the viewport and push Alt-P to unparent and we're going to clear and keep transformation. And then we can just go here and delete these empties right here with X to delete. Uh, you can also just delete this MI plicker, I think it's called. So you can just get rid of that one as well. Now let's rename some of these just to mm, clean things up a little bit. Just press F2 and rename this head mesh and we're just going to rename this collection as well double click in the outline here and let's just call this collection head now just push a to select everything and we're just going to rotate this head so that it's facing upwards so we just do rx minus 90 and it will rotate to face upwards like so you just want to make sure also that your rotation point up the top here is set to median point if you have some troubles rotating all of the objects all at once. So now we're going to create the object which is going to be you know the flakes that kind of come off of her face. Um, so we're just going to duplicate her head with shift D, push escape so that it doesn't you don't move it to another location and then with that head mesh selected here just press M and say new collection and we're going to put this into, we'll call it a sim collection and we'll hit enter on that. Uh, now with that done, we can click this checkbox next to the head collection and turn everything off. So we're just concentrating on the stuff that we're simulating here. And let's hit F2 to rename this one and we're going to call it flakes. Now you'll notice if you zoom into this mesh here, Inside of her head, we've got this kind of mouth bags and eye bags and stuff like that. So we want to get rid of these because we don't want stuff kind of flaking off from inside of her mouth and getting trapped inside and so on. So easiest way I found to do this is if you push tab to go into edit mode, um, make sure you press number one to be to go into vertex mode. And for the mouth, you can actually just pick this one vertex here and then control number pad plus and then just expand this selection out. If we just keep pushing control number pad plus until we start to see some vertices kind of coming out of her mouth like that. If you go a bit too far, you can push control number pad minus and just bring that back. So something like that will do. And let's just go X, delete vertices. And then we want to do something similar for the eyes. Best way I found to do these ones is if you push three to go into face mode, and then you can alt click near this edge of one of the faces. So if you alt click on that edge, it's gonna 
pick an edge loop that goes this way. If you alt click on this edge, you're going to get an edge loop that goes sideways. The trick here is just to find an edge loop that doesn't go crazy like this, but let's just try and find one that kind of just loops around the eye itself. So that looks pretty good, that one there. And let's just go X, delete faces. And then what you can do is with your mouse hovering over this inside part of the eye, you can just push L. And because you're picking this kind of linked mesh here, it's actually been disconnected from the rest of the mesh. And so that just makes it easier just to pick that inside and just hit X and delete faces. So repeat that on the other eye. And now we can just tab out of edit mode and that's all ready to go. So next we're gonna add a subdivision modifier. So let's just add that here, but I might just expand this a bit so we can see things a bit easier. Um, we're gonna add this, but we're just gonna disable it. And we'll probably just uh, leave it disabled for the tutorial, but it's kind of just there. If you wanna um, add some more detail to your simulation later, you can have a play with these settings. Uh, but generally you wanna make sure that whatever you've set in your render levels is also the same as your viewport levels if you're going to use this modifier. Um, but for the time being, let's just close that up here. And so next we're going to add a displace modifier. And what we're going to use this for, we usually put a texture in here and you can kind of do a bit of a displacement map thing. Um, but we're just going to actually use it to kind of offset our surface uh, in a non-destructive way. So if we bring back our head collection here by clicking on the checkbox, if we go Shift Z to go into wireframe view, and I've just gone to a side view here with um, the tilde key, you can bring up this menu and just pick like a view here. Otherwise you can just use uh, the number pad. Um, the various number pad keys will also take you into the different side views and front views and so on. Um, and so we're in wireframe mode here because we want to just check this distance here. We just, we just want to add, like offset the surface just a tiny little bit from the actual um, surface of the head. So I find a strength here of 0.1 does a good job. Um, but because this is just going to be part of the modifier stack, this is totally changeable later when we've done the simulation and so on. So we're going to actually keep this whole simulation thing, the whole setup, uh, non-destructive. And this is a really great way of working because if you find um, something you want to change again later, um, it, it just lets you sort of go back and change things rather than having to kind of rebuild the setup every time you want to change something. So let's just turn the head collection back off again so we can concentrate on this. Again, tilde key and go view selected. Shift Z to go back out of wireframe mode. And we're gonna create a particle system. So if you go into your particles tab here and just hit the plus button, this will create a new particle system. And we're just gonna change a couple of settings here. For number, we're just going to start with 500 here. Our frame start and end, set them to zero. And so that will put all of the 500 particles on all at once, starting at the beginning. So you can see on our mesh here, we've got a bunch of dots and these are gonna be basically kind of the center of each piece or like flake that's gonna come off, right? So let's continue on with settings here. We've got lifetime. We wanna turn this up to more than you have frames. So at the moment we've got 250 frames. We'll set this to like 500. As long as the end frame in your animation is less than this number, you'll be fine. Um, now down here in the source settings, we wanna just turn on use modifier stack and we're gonna turn random off. Um, I find it sort of gives us a bit more of an even distribution of points on the face, which will help to keep the, the flakes kind of a similar size. We're also gonna scroll down here and open up the physics section. And we don't actually want any kind of particle physics going on here. So we're just going to set this physics type to none. And that will keep They'll make sure that the particles just stay put on the surface and there's no uh, movement going on here. And just a couple more settings just to make life a little bit easier. We're gonna go into render here and we don't actually wanna ever render these particles. So we'll just set them to render as none, but then in viewport display, we're gonna turn them to point. And so that then they'll just come back here. So we can see them in the viewport, but they won't ever render. Okay, so that's it for the particle setup. Let's go back into our modifiers and we're gonna add another modifier and it is the explode modifier. And so what explode does is it looks at the particle system on your object 
and then uses each one of those particles as kind of a sort of a center point to break up the mesh into chunks. Now if you go to Alt Z you'll see that our mesh is now kind of broken up into these sort of pieces. Now at the moment the edges are a bit kind of stair-stepped um, but we can kind of get rid of that a bit with this cut edges option. That'll just give them a bit more of a natural sort of edge. And of course you can use this view, the Alt Z uh, X-ray view here, if you wanted to go back to your particle settings and adjust maybe the number of particles. If you want bigger flakes you can just set this number, turn this number down. If you want smaller flakes you can turn it up. Um, but we're just going to stick with 500 for the time being. Now to set up our cloth simulation, we don't want to have to sit here and like simulate the entire mesh while we're kind of just tweaking our settings. So what we're going to do is make um, a cut down version of this mesh, uh, which will help us to just simulate on a smaller section of it, get our settings right, and then we'll put those settings back onto the full size mesh here. So to do that, let's shift D to duplicate. Um, we're going to hide this original flakes mesh here and just with this new one selected we might just rename it and we'll call it test. We can Alt Z to get out of uh, x-ray mode and now if you go up here to object we can say convert to mesh from curve meta surface etc. And all of your particle system and modifier stack and everything will disappear. Uh, that means that it's kind of baked all of our modifiers down into our mesh. And so that means if we go into edit mode now, we can see kind of all of our broken up flakes on here on the face. So if you push Alt A to deselect everything, what we can do is just with our mouse hovering over various parts of the mesh, just use the L key like we did before with those like eye bags and mouth bag and stuff. And just hover the mouse over a bunch of these different points and then push the L key and you'll be adding them to uh, selection. So this much of the mesh will probably be enough. Um, then you just need to just go Control i to invert the mesh, X and delete faces. And so now we just have this one little section here that we're going to work on. All right, so let's get some cloth going. So if you click on this little circle-y kind of icon here, you can find um, physics settings. So we're just going to click on the cloth button and this will turn our mesh into a cloth object. If you click this little menu button here where it says on the cloth header here, we'll pick this silk preset and that'll just preset a bunch of the settings for us to get us started. Um, the quality steps you can, while we're testing, you can just turn this down. So just set that down to one. Um, that just is a subsampling if you've ever done any physics stuff before. Um, so obviously we can turn it up again later, but for now let's just run with uh, number one. And also this effect is, um, it's kind of a zero gravity sort of effect. So we actually want to go right down to the bottom here to field weights. And let's just turn our gravity down to zero. And now we're just going to shift A, go down here to force field, and we'll pick wind. You'll see it creates this little kind of icon here. Um, we want to scale this up. So let's go into the top view and scale it up so it kind of covers the whole area where the head would be. You can turn the head back on if we want to check. Um, so that makes it a little bit easier here. So we can just scale it up to something like that. Turn the head back off. And we're going to go here in the settings and say strength is 100. And what we might do just to keep things organized, up here in the outliner, click on the sim collection here. And you notice when we do that, it kind of gets this very faint kind of an outline here. And that just means it's our current collection so that any new objects that we create will automatically get put into this collection. Um, because we didn't do that before, we created this wind. Let's just drag it into the sim collection. And with the wind selected, let's just F2 rename it to wind. Now if we do Shift A and select turbulence, that will now get added into our sim collection. And again, F2, and let's just rename it to Turb for turbulence because I couldn't be bothered typing turbulence. Let's just go down here, set our strength to 300, and we're going to set the size here to 1. Now what this size does is turbulence is going to kind of add a, just a, a noise into our simulation. And we're going to use this to kind of give the cloth a little bit of a sort of a wavy motion. 
as it kind of peels off of the face. Basically what we're gonna do is take this turbulence and kind of animate it so that the noise will move through the cloth as it sort of moves up from being pushed by the wind. And that will give us a nice kind of a flaky, floaty kind of cloth feel. We're just gonna tweak a couple of other parameters here. Um, obviously I've just kind of done a bit of research and worked out what's the best sort of settings to get this nice kind of look that we're after. And I found just turning this bending damping down will help to kind of make the cloth kind of bend a bit nicer. Another thing I found was just turning this air viscosity down a little bit. So 0.5 instead of one. So that's all looking pretty good. Now let's animate this turbulence. Let's go into a side view here and you can just grab this turbulence with the G key, move it to, um, you know, any position, doesn't really matter. Uh, we're just gonna go into the object parameters here. And uh, with our frame set to frame one, let's just hit this little button, little dot next to the Z location. And we're gonna, that'll just set a keyframe there. Let's just drag it all the way over to 250 and just use G, Z, and move it up to something like this. Uh, we'll check it in a second, but let's just set a key there. We wanna just, with our mouse hovered over the timeline here, just push the T key, set this to linear. Now, now there's a couple of shortcut keys that you're gonna really wanna get used to using if you're doing a lot of simulation stuff. Basically, shift left arrow will reset your time back to the first frame and space will play. So obviously you can see you'll, you'll push space, check the setup. You're like, oh, I want to change, you know, such and such parameter. Go in here, change some parameters, shift left arrow, space to play again, and then rinse and repeat. So these settings are all looking pretty good. Don't forget to save at this point. Um, would suck to kind of lose all the work we've done so far. So now in the cloth settings here, again, with our test object selected, you'll remember we had this little presets menu. So an easy way to transfer settings from one object to another would be just to save our own little preset here. So let's do that. With this menu open, you can just, where it says new preset, select that and type whatever you want. We'll call it flakes. Uh, and then you just push this plus button and then you'll have a little flakes um, preset already set here. And so now we can just hide this test object. And what we'll actually do first is up here in this filters, uh, icon, enable these two filters here. One looks like a monitor, one looks like a camera, and that's our viewport and render visibility. You'll notice if you hide something with just the eyeball, it'll still actually show up in your render if this camera is not turned off as well. So I always find it's good just to have these showing all the time. So in the case of our test sim here, we just want to, we can drag across all three of those and turn it off for everything. Turn it off for viewport, render, and just standard view. Now we're just gonna turn our flakes back on, select the object, and then we're gonna click the cloth button again for this object. And then we can just go in here and pick our flakes preset. And you can see quality steps has been set to one. Our bending damping is set to 0.1. Uh, the one thing you won't get with the preset is the uh, gravity doesn't come across. So you'll just have to come in here into field weights and set your gravity down to zero again. And now if we push play and let's actually save this first, control S. So when we push play, what happens now is all of our flakes all kind of fly up at the same time. But what we want to do is we're going to use the pinning feature in the cloth simulation to pin down all of the parts of the mesh that we don't want to move. Then we're gonna have an influence object that as it kind of encloses different parts of the mesh, those parts will get released from the pin and then they will start to flake up and fly away. So we just need to go in here, push shift A and under empty, we're going to make an empty sphere. And if you push the S key, let's just scale it up so that it's sort of encompasses the whole head. So something like that will do the trick. And if we just go into a side view here, we're just going to push G, Z, and just move it up above the head like so. Now on our head itself here, let's go into our modifiers and let's just close down some of these other modifiers here. And we're just going to add a modifier and we're gonna pick this vertex weight proximity. And what we want to do with this is we want to just push this up arrow here so that it happens before the cloth. 
So, you know, in the modifier stack, the modifiers happen from top down. So subdivision and then displace and then particle settings and so on. So this will just make sure that this vertex weight thing happens before our cloth setup. You'll notice that it needs a vertex group here. So let's create one. If you go into this triangle, green triangle button, and you push the plus key here, that will make a vertex group. So let's double click it and we'll rename it to pinned. And now if you tab into edit mode, push number one on the keyboard to go into vertex mode, press A to select everything. And then you wanna hit this assign button here with this pinned group selected. And so if we tab back out of edit mode, we go back into our modifier panel here. And here where it says vertex group, we're gonna select our pinned vertex group. For the target object, we're gonna select our empty here and actually let's rename it. So let's pick this, push F2 and we'll call it influence. And then back on the head, we're gonna pick our distance setting here and set it to geometry. And here where it says fall off type, let's pick this smooth fall off. And now what we're gonna do is animate our sphere here to slowly kind of encompass the head. Um, before we do that, let's go back into the head and turn off the cloth display because we don't want this updating as we're animating. And let's pick our influence object here. And then in this uh, object parameters, we're, with our frame set to frame one, let's just hit this dot next to the Z here to set a keyframe. And then we can do shift right arrow to go to the end of our animation range here. And then in this uh, side view, we're just gonna go GZ and move this sphere down to encompass the head, something like that. And then just hit our button again on Z. And then with the pointer hovering over the timeline here, we wanna push the T key, set these to linear. And now if we hit space bar to play, you'll see that our sphere kind of slowly pushes its way down into the head. Now, one last thing we need to do is we need to tell the, the modifier here how big our sphere of influence is. And that's using these two parameters here, highest and lowest. So the best way to do that I found was to pick the sphere here, go to the N uh, side menu and select the item tab here. And you can see in our scale factor here what we scaled the sphere up to. So it's pretty close to 13 units here. So let's just pick our head. And what we wanna do is set our highest to 13 and then lowest will be a little bit less, um, probably go like a one unit less maybe. So we'll call that 12. And what this does is highest means that the, the highest weight for this pinned group is going to be from 13 units onwards. So that basically means anything outside of this sphere will be set to be fully within this group, fully pinned. But lowest means anything under this number will become zero and so is therefore not pinned anymore. The only way I've found to visualize this is by going into weight paint mode. If you just scrub through your animation here, you can just double check that it's all kind of working. And of course you can go in here and tweak these numbers if you want to sort of smooth off that fall off. But I found like a really kind of a pretty harsh sort of fall off actually works the best um, with getting that real kind of flaky sort of feel. So this is all looking pretty good. This is definitely working how we want it to. So let's just go back to object mode here. We'll re-enable our cloth down the bottom of our modifier stack. Go into our cloth settings here and we're just gonna tell it to use this pinned group to pin the cloth down. So if you go into shape here, and then where it says pin group, you just need to select our pinned group here. So now that as we push play, you'll see that all of our flakes stay in the same position that we want. And then as the sphere kind of cuts into the face, we get those flakes kind of being released. One thing you'll notice as you play through the animation is that you'll get this kind of dark blue bar here that sort of slowly fills up as it plays through. And what that is, is a memory cache for your simulation. And so once that cache is full, you can actually scrub through your animation fairly easily like this. So that's a very handy little feature. One thing we're just gonna do now is quickly, I wanna just tweak the animation for this um, turbulence field that we have here. It sort of needs to travel kind of a little bit faster than 
the flakes are kind of floating up and that will help to give it a bit more of a sort of a wavy sort of feel as they sort of float away. So let's just jump in here. We can probably, the easiest way to do it maybe is if we split this window, which you can do by hovering your mouse cursor over the corner of any window until it turns into an X and then you drag it up. And then if you just go in here into the graph editor, um, this is our animation here because we have the turbulence uh, icon selected and I want to make it go like a little bit faster. So I'm just going to select this last keyframe here, GY, and I might just drag it up a little bit. Ah, because we've changed something to do with our simulation, we've now lost our cache uh, in the bottom here. Um, so we'll have to rerun that again. And so once that's done, let's just get rid of our window down the bottom here again by dragging from the corner down into that window to delete it. And a couple of other final tweaks is we're going to first set up the head as a collision object for the flaky material so that we don't get any flakes kind of intersecting uh, with the face when we render it. Uh, so to do that, we're going to go into our turn on our head collection again. We just need our head mesh and these two outer eye objects. Now with our mouse over the viewport, we're going to do Shift M. And the difference here between Shift M and just purely M is that objects can actually be members of more than one collection. And so whereas M will move objects between different collections, Shift M will actually add them to a new collection but keep them in the old collection that they're already in. So with Shift M, we just go New Collection and let's call this one Collision. And as you can see, they've stayed in the head collection, but they're also now in this collision collection. And we can just fold this closed. And now that we've added those objects to the collection, we'll need to just also click each one of them. So click the head mesh and turn on the collision settings in the physics tab. And we'll need to do that also for each of the eye outer objects like so. And then select our flakes mesh here. And under our cloth settings, we want to go down to collisions. And in here, we have a collision collection, which we can just select our collision collection. Okay, that's all good. And now what we're going to do is set up a disk cache for our simulation. So let's just go into the cache settings here. And you'll notice here, it's kind of got a little entry here. Um, I like to name this just so the files on disk will actually get this name. So we'll just call this flakes. Our start and end frame are set correctly, um, but you just, you just want to double check these. And there's two different ways you can cache things in Blender in for physics simulations. Uh, you can kind of just leave it as is and hit the bake button and it will save it into memory. And then when you save your blend file, all of that data gets saved into the blend file. This can be good. It makes like um, managing the files a bit easier, but I prefer doing a disk cache because then you don't have this massive blender file because what the disk cache setting does is actually put it into a folder next to the blend file and it'll save each frame as its own file in that folder. It has one big disadvantage in that if you do a file save as, it won't make a new copy of your cache. So you'd have to actually go back into your folder and make a copy yourself or rename the folder so that it will pick up uh, the cache under the new name. It's a bit of a pain. And again, you know, there's pluses and minuses for both kind of techniques and it's up to you to kind of decide which one you like to use. We're just going to go for disk cache. But if you, don't, you just want to do the normal one, you can just not turn on this option here. And one last step, you want to make sure that you have saved your file before you go ahead with this step. And then you're just going to hit the bake button here. And so once that's done, you should be able to just scrub through your animation like so and see it all play back nicely. All right, so let's get this rendering. Let's go Shift A, add a camera, and then we'll go into our View Pi menu here. We'll go into our Side View menu here with the N key. And then we want to lock camera to view here. And then let's just pull out and get like a nice little side view. Um, you can go into the camera settings here and change the focal length. Let's make it 85. It'll give, it, give us a bit of a tighter shot here and compress the perspective a little bit. And so just set up something nice like this. Go back into the end menu, turn off the lock camera. 
And then we're just going to zoom into her eye here. And it looks like it's not on smooth shading. So double check that and actually make sure all the objects are on smooth shading here. That's a bit annoying. Anyway, um, so pick this, this eye here and hold down shift and right click. And that's going to place our 3D cursor right on the top of her eye there. And we're going to use that as our focal point for a bit of depth of field. So just go shift A, add an empty, you can do a plane axis will do, push F2 and name this focus and then back on our camera we're going to turn on depth of field, pick our focus object as focus and the f-stop we have to turn this like right down because the scale of our scene is pretty high, like higher than it should be. Um, so this f-stop stop, will turn it right down to like 0 0.08 that gives kind of a nice um, out of focus depth background and just a little bit of depth of field. Now let's split our window here and we're going to go into the shader editor and let's go to the world section and we'll just add an HDRI here. You can push N to get rid of this side panel here if you're not going to use it. Um, control space we can make this a bit bigger and then if we do shift A uh, you can click this search and type environment texture and then if you pick open and I'll put a I'll HDR in the comments, the one that I'm using. Uh, and again, it's the old HDRI Haven, our, our mates. And then so hook your uh, color into the color of the background with the texture selected and make sure you have Node Wrangler enabled in your add-ons. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go check out the shortcuts video, which I'll put up on the screen here. Um, but you want to do with the Node Wrangler enabled, push Control T and that'll just make your mapping coordinate nodes here and that will just allow us to rotate the HDR around to where we want it. So control space to go back out in our viewport here let's go to the camera view let's push uh, the Z key and then go up to rendered mode in your render settings here let's just flick it to Eevee if it's not already and we're just going to use this Z rotation here on our environment just to pull it around so that we've got yeah, a bit of bit of kind of highlights, nice kind of out of focus highlights in the background there. So about 162 is what I've got here. And so another thing we want to do here is just set our strength down to 0.3. And we're going to make this kind of a bit of a blue color here. So we're just going to go shift A. And I like to put a shortcut key on this search. Um, if you've seen my other videos, you're probably sick of me saying this. So if you just right click it, go assign shortcut, and then I do like a control shift A. And so now we can just type control shift a and do searching for things so, so we want a mix rgb and we're just going to drop that on top of this little noodle here we're going to make it a multiply turn the factor up to one and then looking at this kind of background here we're just going to make it into a bit of a blue kind of color so something kind of like that will do the trick and we're just going to jump into our render settings here and let's turn on some cool effects. We're going to turn on screen space reflections. Uh, we're going to be using the refraction feature, uh, mostly for our eyes, I think. We can turn these settings up if your machine uh, can handle all of this. Hopefully it shouldn't be too bad as far as rendering is concerned. Um, so I generally will just turn this trace position up to one, turn off the half res trace. Um, and that'll just basically give you the best kind of reflection and refraction quality. We also want to go down here to shadows and we're going to change the method to VSM because we're going to have a bit of translu translucency in the flaky stuff. So uh, this seemed to be a better option for doing that. Uh, but we also want this high bit depth and soft shadows turned on. So let's add some lights. Um, we'll split our view across here like so. And we'll leave this as our kind of rendered view here for preview. And then on this side, we'll just do shift A, add in an area light. And let's put this, we want this area light, this will be kind of a backlight. So if we go into the top view, we can kind of drag it over to the left here. You can see our camera's on the right. So we want this light to be behind her head and a little bit off to the side, something like that kind of a location. And then we just do down the rotate like so, and then we go to the front view, rotate like so. Let's right view again. Rotate back a little bit. Top view. Kind of just something like this, where you've kind of got it just as a backlight. Um, now the size, we want to make it a bit bigger, so let's go into the light settings here. Um, and then make the shape a disc, 
and the size we'll just crank it up here you can use these handles here in the viewport as well to get the size you want so something like that about 30. Um, now in the top view let's shift d to duplicate it rotate it around almost like a 180 degrees and we're just going to use this as like a little bit of a fill light um, so move it into this kind of a position maybe kind of something like this and in these views we'll just bring it down a little bit rotate it up a bit like so and for this light we're going to make it we're just going to give it a little bit of warmth a little bit of sort of orangey kind of color like so and we can't see much at the moment so this one I think we'll need to crank up to like 10,000 and you can see a bit of that light coming through here that's pretty good and then this backlight here let's make it a little bit blue and we'll make that 50,000 and you can see we're getting this kind of highlight here and a bit of highlights here and what's going to happen with this light as well is it's going to shine through the kind of translucent flaky stuff and really get us a nice kind of backlight sort of feel. Okay, so let's get those shaders going. We'll go into the shading area for this, I think. Up here, we'll change this into our render view, make it our camera. And so let's grab our head here and create a new shader. And we'll just call this head. And we're gonna grab the textures that came with the download of the model. So you can do that, you can just browse to the textures from this left hand panel here. Um, and we're going to grab this color raw and we just want the diffuse from there. And we can just drag and drop that into the shader editor here. And we're going to plug this into the subsurface color. And we'll crank the subsurface all the way up to one. And you can see it's kind of come through there. We might want to just pick the flakes for the time being and hide it just so we can see what we're doing here. Then we're also going to grab this specular map here. Let's drag and drop again. We want to add in a math node and our color is going to go into the top and we're just going to change it to a multiply and then that value is going to go into our specular setting here. And you can kind of tweak the roughness a little bit as well. I found just turning it down a little bit sort of 0.44 uh, seems to give a good result. And lastly we're going to use the um, displacement map that comes with the model. So we'll go into the displacement folder and we'll just have a look at the names of these. We want to grab this one that's just called displacement. So not the micro one, just the displacement one. We'll just drag that again into our shader editor here. Now if we're using EV, you can just plug this, use it as a bump map. So you could just plug it, you know, create a bump map and plug it into the normal input here. Um, but if you ever want to render this in cycles, um, you can just use a displacement map and plug it into the displacement here and it'll be the exact same result um, except that you have the option later if you go into cycles that you can actually use it as a displacement map without having to change your shader at all. So let's do that. Control shift A, make a displacement node, drop that down. Color is going to go into the height. We set our mid level down to zero because this is actually a floating point image here which you can see by the fact that it's come in as a linear image and then we want to go from displacement into the displacement here and then when we come back out we can see that that's been applied to our model here. Uh, I'd say this scale probably needs to come down to sort of 0.5 to make it look a bit more natural. Uh, so that's looking really good. Now let's just show, bring our flakes back in here and let's work on that shader. So we'll grab a new shader, call it flakes. And we're just going to turn the roughness down a little bit so we get a little bit of a shine on there. And then we're going to go Control shift a and add in an Add Shader. And if we just drag that in between these connections here, you'll see the, the connection highlights and we'll just drop it. And then Control shift a again and we're going to add in a Translucent BSDF. So grab that guy, plug it into the bottom shader slot. And now you can see we've got this nice kind of translucent effect here. You can adjust the sort of levels. I mean, I might, you might want to kind of bring the base color down of both of them just to kind of get it to the sort of right brightness that you want. Uh, you'll also notice these kind of blockiness here. You'll just need to go into your EV settings and back in the shadows. 
you want to turn this cube size up until the blocks disappear. So probably a 2K might do the trick. Um, you'll see banding as well, but that's basically your uh, sampling here. So, I mean, if I turn the viewport sampling up to like 64, the banding will sort of go away. But that's something else you'll need to adjust. What we might do is just turn this viewport back down to 16, and we're going to set the render sampling up to 80. And that I found that seems to do a pretty good job. And now, last but not least, let's have a look at her eye. Um, now, there's no time slider in this shader view, so we can just go shift right arrow, and that'll take us to the last frame here so that we can see her eye. And you can just zoom in on this viewport here. And so we're just going to pick the eye outer, add a new shader, and we'll call this eye outer. And we're going to turn the transmission all the way up to one. Turn the roughness all the way down to zero. The IOR should be 1.3333. And if we push N to bring up this side panel here, we need to go into this options section here to tell it to make the eye shader transparent. I think this option is kind of going away in 281, so it might not be here for you if you're watching this in the future. Uh, but for the time being, what we need to do is go here into blend mode and set it to alpha blend. And then we probably want to make this shadow mode none so that it's not casting any shadows on the objects inside. And we also just need to make sure that screen space refraction is turned on. And because we enabled that in our EV settings as well, we'll now get a refraction effect happening here. And so let's take that eye outer shader and assign it to the other side as well, just in case we ever see the other side. And let's work on the inside eye. So I think it's which one is it? Okay, so it's this I inner 001. And to make life a little bit easier, we're just going to push the forward slash button and that will just isolate the eye by itself and we can work on that. Um, so then let's make a new shader. We'll call it I inner. We're gonna turn the roughness all the way up. Uh, let's make this bigger. And let's make a couple of nodes. We'll go a gradient texture and we want a color ramp and so our color ramp is going into our base color our gradient texture factor goes into the color ramp factor then with the gradient texture node selected control T again to make your mapping nodes and because of the way the UVs come with this model on the eye inner object we'll just need to do a minus 90 rotation in the Z and then if we control space so we can go back to our view we just need to go into our color ramp here Select this first swatch and we'll make it white. We'll select, uh, we'll do hit the plus, make another white swatch. Um, select that one, hit the plus again. Uh, it's made another one, okay. We'll basically just wanna drag this swatch up to here, so like 0.845. This one, we'll drag it up pretty close to that one. And in here, let's just make this a blue color. And we'll also make this one a blue color. And you'll see the, the effect we're looking for is kind of happening on this side of the eyeball because I think I must have forgotten, yes. So I need to take this texture coordinate and plug the UV into our mapping node. And now you'll see that the blue part of the eye, what is it, like the iris or something I think it's called, is now up the top here. If we wanna get a better view of what we're doing with the texture, we can control shift click this color ramp and we just wanna basically set the iris up so that it looks like it's kind of just covering that the right section of the eyeball. And grab this, make it maybe a little bit darker like so. Something along those kind of lines. And then if we control shift click our principal BSDF, that'll take us back to the full shader. And if we push our forward slash button again, that'll bring us back out to the proper view of the whole scene. And we just want to pick the other eye inner as well, just to make sure and give it the same shader. And let's do a save just in case. And now if we go to our camera view, we can see that that's looking pretty good. Looks like an eye. If you're getting this weird kind of line here, you just need to turn this show back face off. And there you go, that's looking a lot better. So if you're going to set this up for cycles, I recommend go into your head shader here, open up the settings, and you want to make sure that displacement is set to either displacement and bump or displacement only, and that will enable the displacement map that we've put in here. And you also wanna make sure that you're using 
here where it says Christensen Burley, you want to change this to random walk subsurface scattering. And that will just give you a bit more of a realistic kind of skin um, look to the shader. And the last thing you want to make sure is just to add a subdivision surface to pretty much all your objects that you're going to render, um, except for the flakes. Um, and then just set it to adaptive and that will just give you a bit more displacement detail in your render. And then when that's all done, let's just hit the render button and see what we get. And that looks pretty good. Uh, it could do with a couple of tweaks, I think. Make the eye maybe a little bit darker. We reckon this background could be a bit kind of bluer. Um, but go ahead and tweak to your heart's content and you'll get something cool like this. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'm going to chuck up a couple of other tutorials up on the screen here. If you haven't been to my channel before, feel free to go check them out. And if you like what you see, hit that old subscribe button and hit the like button and I'll see you in the next one.